All right, welcome everyone. We just wait a few more minutes until we get started to make sure everyone gets a chance to attend. You know how it goes with these meetings, right? I like uh, being on time sometimes a little bit tough. Right, I need a second. Let me start start sharing again. There we go. Ah, I already see some familiar names here in the attendee list, so that's great. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, old friends. Welcome, new friends. Someone raised your hand. Oh, no, it's gone. Uh, we will wait a few more minutes, give it like two or three minutes, and then we will get started. Got to keep the sun out a little bit here. <laughs> uh, well, we can be thankful at least if the weather is nice uh, and sun is, is shining here in, in Dresden, Germany. All right. Yeah, one, one more minute, then we get started. Oh, there's already a question. Thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, the chat is disabled, so you can, if you have any questions, just enter them in the Q&A window and uh, we will go through them at the end of the session. I should have a couple of minutes at the end of the session to actually answer your questions. How do you see the future of the immersive web? Well, I think it's an exciting future for sure. Uh, there's a lot of stuff happening with web AR. Uh, but yeah, let's let's chat a little bit more uh, about these questions at the end of the session. I think we should get started already. So there we go. Back to my slides. All righty. Welcome everyone. Welcome to the session here as a reply a webinar. The session is called Spatial Computing, the next wave of computing. And I hope we can live up to the hype in this session because I will show you lots of use cases. I will also, of course, explain what is spatial computing and what all this terminology actually means um, and what is VR and AR and MR and XR and all that stuff. I know a lot of you are probably already familiar, but we will go through that, right? And so after the intro, I will talk about a lot of use cases. We will talk about spatial computing use cases like digital twins. And uh, we will talk about how you can combine mixed reality with AI for real-time object recognition. We will talk about our immersive telepresence solution called Holobeam, which allows you to stream volumetric video. And then we will talk about uh, some Azure mixed reality services like um, Azure Remote Rendering, which allows us to render these huge models with millions or hundreds of millions of polygons uh, still on the HoloLens on a mobile device um, by using remote rendering in the cloud. And then we will talk about the augmented reality cloud and an implementation of that, like the Azure Spatial Anchor service that allows us to have a digital copy of our real world um, to then persist content. And uh, we will talk about the transformation of technology quite a bit. And like I said, uh, we will have some time for Q&A at the end, hopefully. 
Alrighty, uh, my name is Rene. I'm Director of Global Innovation at Valorum Reply, uh, part of the Reply network, of course. Uh, Valorum Reply has a strong partnership with Microsoft, so we work with a lot of technologies starting from the back end to the front end, like you know, Azure Cloud Computing, Data Science, uh, Digital Insights. Uh, we do also quite a bit of the strategy consulting, like digital strategy, and then you know, also the front end side of the house, like um, you know, classic applications, web apps, uh, modern apps in general. And of course, also spatial computing applications like, and we have been working with the whole lens in particular since 2015. And uh, yeah, 2015, right? It's five years old now. Uh, happy birthday, HoloLens. And it's crazy how time flies, right? And so we've been part of that HoloLens agency program, which is now called the Mixed Reality Partner Program and have been working with many clients on different implementations for you know whatever custom solution it requires. And I hope I can share some of that uh, knowledge here today, which we gain throughout the years. I'm also a Microsoft Regional Director and MVP. Uh, these are awards that Microsoft uh, gives to independent experts that share knowledge. So I do a lot of conference uh, talking. These days it's all virtual, of course. Um, you know, also a lot of social media interactions. So connect with me on LinkedIn. You will see me sharing a ton of stuff all the time or Twitter and so on. And then of course I also have some open source projects. And that's being basically honored with these awards, right? I'm also an advisor for the Beyond AI Association as well as the XR Bootcamp. Alrighty, so enough of that uh, little bit of introducing myself. Uh, let's start with a small intro and tell you how we come to the spatial computing terminology, right? So we started with personal computing in the, uh, well, 80s, 70s, and really it took off in the 90s, right? And a lot of people actually had the first computer. Uh, for me, it was the Amiga 500, the, yeah, Amiga. And, you know, then, of course, the PC later on. And, uh, yeah, you know, personal computing became a thing and really became a real, real thing once all these computers became connected, right? We had the internet when Tim Berners-Lee invented the first web browser and server in 1989. And then, you know, we had the rise of the, the World Wide Web in the 90s. And then especially with the web 2.0 stuff in the 2000s, where we could have user generated content like blogs, social media and so on, right? That really democratized all the knowledge sharing. Um, and that helped a lot. So we had personal computing, right? And then we also had mobile phones and later on we had these smartphones like Blackberry was really big there. And especially when the first multi-touch uh, mo uh, smartphone came out with the iPhone in 2007, it was, yeah, it was really disrupting everything, right? And uh, this is when we had this true mobile computing platform and you know, with uh, all these connectivity, uh, you know, benefits and, you know, all these progress that happens with 4G and now 5G these days, right? We have these super highly connected devices with that can do a lot of things already. And, uh, you know, a lot of people actually use mobile phones these days as their first computing platform, actually, right? Like if I look at my kids, they use mobile phones. They don't use their PC too much uh, or a lot. They actually do a lot of that on mobile computing. So we came from personal computing to mobile computing, and then we will come into spatial computing. And this is a, you know, as some of you know, the Oculus uh, Rift Development Kit 1, which was released in 2012. And of course, it's not the first VR headset, right? We had some of those in the 90s, uh, but the Oculus Rift got me really excited, the DK1, because it had the first really good resolution latency, right? When you move your head, you didn't have any smearing too much and was really uh, spot on and a really great user experience and it was fun to develop for it. And it's a huge success, right? As you might have heard, uh, Facebook just announced um, that they made almost $300 million in non-advertising and quarter one of this year already, right? And they basically say that this is driven largely by a sales of Oculus products. And that is, this is actually 80% higher than the numbers of the same quarter last year, right? So again, 80% more revenue compared to the quarter last year and in non-advertising, right? And that is majority comes from the Oculus, uh, which Facebook acquired a couple of years ago. And the Oculus Quest, of course, is one of the best devices, standalone, untethered virtual reality headset. But anyway, what I wanted to tell you is like, we had this kind of movement with spatial computing devices uh, that came around because like these VR devices can also track where they are in the room, they're spatially aware. And of course, with the HoloLens, right? I mentioned in 2015, 2016, uh, we had the HoloLens 1 release. Now we have the, the HoloLens 2, which you can see here in the video, and I also have one with me here. Uh, but anyway, you know, we have these special computing devices, and with the HoloLens, we have 
the capabilities where they can track themselves in the room, they can analyze the room, and so you can view space travel like in your own space, if you will, right? And uh, this is, of course, the moon landing, and so you can experience that. This one is actually using remote rendering, which we're going to talk quite a bit more uh, later on. Uh, but yeah, see the quality, right? And this is uh, with the HoloLens 2 remote rendering, and this is where we are at the moment, so we can see space travel in our own space. And in fact, the HoloLens was already in space before, and this is actually astronaut Scott Kelly on the International Space Station, where he's having a virtual call with ground control using Holosky back then, or it was also called Project Sidekick. And so what, what they do is basically they can stream the camera from the HoloLens, right? The, the main camera in the middle, or the webcam, if you will, um, and stream that down to the ground control. They can see what Scott Kelly is seeing and then scribble into his part, right? As you can see here in the video, so can they can oh see on God. the ground control what he's seeing, and then they can draw into the, the space and uh, help him basically to maintain certain things or, you know, basically remote assistance, right? And this, of course, now these days we have remote assist, a product from Microsoft for, for that kind of stuff. And of course, also Holobeam, right? Which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But uh, back to Earth, um, now with all these space computing devices, uh, the only piece that is missing and that is really at the moment becoming a thing and you know all of that is coming together is the augmented reality cloud. This digital copy, this digital or digital twin of our physical world, right? So with all of these devices and mobile phones are also a part of that, right? Because they can spatially sense the world around us, right? And so we get this digital copy of our physical world, uh, which we can then use to, um, you know, place content, but we will talk about that much, much more uh, at the uh, later on the session. A um, lot of companies are working on AR cloud solutions, uh, which some of them call, like Facebook calls them life maps, Magic Wars, Mirror World, Google Cloud Anchors. Um, we have some startups like 60 AI, 60 AI which was just acquired by Niantic, um, or um, Visual X from Berlin, and a few more, and of course, Azure Spatial Anchors, which we're going to cover later on. But anyway, what you can see on the video is we have this digital copy of our real world, which means we can bring in virtual content as you know and persist it as part of the real world so we can get all of that data and of course thinking about 5g again all of these puzzle pieces come together we can stream an immense amount of data right all right let's talk about this terminology before we dive into all of these use cases again i know a lot of you are already familiar with it but i want to make sure we're all on the same page here and so let me explain that a little bit what is ar vr mr xr spatial computing all of that stuff so let's start with VR, virtual reality, which you can see on the right-hand side there. And so VR is really a fully immersive solution, which means you're fully immersed into a virtual um, application or experience, if you will. And that is done by wearing a head-mounted device, like a VR device, where you can see stereo frames, basically a frame for the left and the right eye, and therefore you can see stereo 3D, right? And typically you also have spatial sound, so you can hear a spatial sound, you basically can recognize, or your brain can recognize where a sound is coming from in a room. And that is possible as well with most VR headsets. But the, the main thing is you're fully immersed, you don't see the outside world anymore. In comparison to augmented reality, which you can see on the left side, uh, with AR you can still see the real world, right? And there are different form factors available, and the most AR solutions we still have with a wide reach these days are on mobile phones. And uh, basically what it does is it analyzes the camera data, right? So the camera uh, data comes in, is then shown on the screen. And basically uh, this camera data is also analyzed with computer vision algorithms. And then on the screen, you see the camera feed plus virtual objects. So the main difference is AR allows you to still see the real world and then it's augmented with virtual objects on top of that. Of course, mobile form factors, well, you just have this tiny window, right? You just see it like that small. And so that might be a little bit of a challenge if you're uh, using an AR solution. Uh, you just have a monoscopic camera, so you don't get stereo vision, basically. So, well, not, not amazing, but still pretty good. And if we look into uh, head-mounted devices like the HoloLens uh, 2 I have here as well, of course, it's much, much better, right? It's much more immersive, although it's still being AR, and you can see these semi-transparent lenses, so we can still see the real world, 
and then we can augment it with a virtual object on top of it. And it has a bunch of sensors that can track the device in the room, right? So it knows where it is in the room and head rotation, of course, and also the depth sensors in here, so it can measure the distance to the real world objects. So it's very much spatially aware as it is, right? And of course, if you're wearing a head mounted device, you also don't have any latency from a camera that further needs to process the data, right? You see the real world with your own eyes without any latency. And of course, the virtual content needs to render very fast, um, 60 frames per second, so it stays stable even if you walk around, right? So we have VR and AR, and the umbrella term that Microsoft is using is called mixed reality. And that is basically a spectrum where you have VR on one end, and on the other hand, you have AR. And I definitely see a vision here as well, because like at one point in the 2020s, I'm pretty sure we will have devices that can fulfill the whole spectrum, right? So we might be able to shut down the visor, we're fully immersed in VR, open the visor and still see the real world and we're more in an AR setting, right? And already uh, devices like the HoloLens, they can transform your whole room in a different setup, right? Because they recognize uh, there's a wall, there's a table. And so you can have a different wallpaper, right? And so you're, you're much more immersed than just like, a, like an AR solution on your mobile phone where you just see a tiny AR piece on, on top of the real world, right? So AR, VR, mixed reality on top of that. Uh, another terminology we see a lot being used these days is XR, extended reality. It's especially used by Qualcomm and Unity and so on. But basically, it's just another term for AR and VR. And then we have spatial computing. And I really like it because like you heard the story, right? We came from personal computing to mobile computing. And the next wave is spatial computing, which we will see really taking off in 2020s. And it not does not just include AR and VR devices, but also spatial computing devices like 3D sensing camera, like a Kinect, like a 3D camera or other things, other devices that can spatially sense their surroundings, right? And it's an exciting time to be working in that space for sure, right? So AR and VR, uh, here's a fun one. VR is also for cows, apparently. That's a real one, right? That, as you can see on the, on the right-hand side, it's from the Ministry of Agriculture in the Moscow district. So that really build a custom VR headset or rather a 360 video viewer where they show these cows a relaxing green grass field instead of a depressing form, I guess. And so I guess that helps to you know, reduce stress and produce better milk or whatever. A uh, little bit controversial, of course, right? It feels a little bit like the metrics, but well, you know, if, uh, if it helps the cows to have a better life, who knows, right? Maybe, it, maybe it's great. But anyway, fun stuff. Uh, VR is not just for humans. Uh, right, let's talk about use cases. And um, first of all, we're going to start with digital twins. And I know a lot of you are already familiar with digital twins, just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Basically, a digital twin is a digital replica of a physical entity, of a real world entity. And so that could even be your organization hierarchy, right? So like your company's hierarchy structure, could you could even build that as a digital twin. Uh, but typically what we're talking about is like physical objects, like a like a building, like a facility, a factory, or an engine or whatever, or you can see on the screenshot, uh, this is a jet engine, right? And so we have this real object and then we have a 3D model of it, but the digital twin is not just a 3D model. The, the, free, the digital twin is that you have the sensor data that comes from the real world object, which has some IoT sensors um, that are then visualized on top of that 3D model, right? And then it becomes a digital twin. And so you have a kind of real time data from the real machine but you see it not just in a table where you see all these IoT sensors bubbling up the data, you see it actually in the context of the real world machine uh, in the 3D model, right? So that of course helps you to get real time insights much faster. And so we build an application uh, with the HoloLens for the Microsoft Technology Centers, the MTCs, uh, this digital twin application, uh, which allows you to basically do that. And what you can see here in the video, and the lady is wearing a hall lens. She's placing a chemical plant um, at the, um, uh, well, she's using a hall lens and placing a chemical plant right, right there somewhere. And then you can see this, oopsie. Well, that was not what I wanted to do. Let me go back, sorry for that. And there we go, skip forward. All right, so this is what I wanted to show you. Um, take a look at these kind of, uh, sensor data, right? So you have these sensors, and again, this is a, the, the 3D model of a chemical plant, right? And you have these IoT sensors all over the place. These are these little uh, boxes here with the three dots, right? And one is open there where you can see the actually sensor reading, the current sensor reading from the real chemical plant, right? 
So you have a bunch of sensors in your real chemical plant and then you visualize it on top of that 3D model to get these context information and get much more insights, much faster. You see temperature, humidity, pressure, and so on, right? And so we have that part of the digital twin. And in this solution, we also added another one for a training scenario. And you can see the little sensor box at the bottom left there, this blue box. So this is the real sensor box that provides that sensor data, in fact. And now we have a digital twin of that as well for showing repair instructions, right? So as you can see there, they're showing a little hologram where you can see the um, repair instructions, how you need to open the, the thing and you know replace the fuse and whatnot. So a lot of potential and a lot of companies are investing a lot of money actually, in fact, into digital twin solutions because there's an immense business value. Uh, if you read Gartner reports, um, they also label uh, digital twins as one of these emerging technologies that will gain a lot of traction and is labeled as transformational because it brings a lot of business value. Here's another one we built for an automotive seat manufacturer. So what you can do in this application as well, you can basically learn how to assemble this automotive seat. And this uh, client had a challenge with a lot of turnover rate in certain factories. Basically people come there for a few weeks, work there, need to get trained and then they leave for the next job, right? So they need to constantly train people, but there's just a limited amount of trainers they have. And so with this application, you put on the hollow lens and then you can do these kind of assembly steps yourself and the easy ones, right? So the trainer is then uh, more approachable for you know, helping with more harder tasks where you really, really need some hands on time with a trainer. And well, this is really great. I tried it out myself the first time I was able to assemble that seat without having, it any, without having any training before. And so that's amazing because we can show context relevant information on top of real objects. Uh, with devices like the HoloLens because you're wearing basically a computer on your head. You have your hands free, right? You you don't have any cable. It's fully untethered, no cables connected, all the processing built in. So you just wear it on your head, use your hands for real world tools and you know can build stuff, which is awesome. Alrighty, let's go on to HoloBeam, which is our immersive telepresence solution. So HoloBeam is, like I mentioned, our 3D volumetric video streaming solution where we can stream a real-time 3D video basically across the globe and just use a normal internet connection. And we're using adaptive streaming, meaning uh, if your internet is basically uh, not as good, if you don't have like 10 Mbit, that's what we require for full HD. Uh, if you have much less, well, we reduce the quality. That's what adaptive streaming is all about. And well, yeah, as you can see here, um, you know, you can actually stream that across the globe. Um, in one scene, you can actually see me beaming from here in Germany into the New York City store of Microsoft. Again, real time and uh, you wear a HoloLens and you can see the other person as a 3D hologram and your own space, which is pretty amazing. And what we do here is we use a 3D camera like an Azure Connect, which I have here. I will show you actually live demo in a few more minutes. And we take the data from this 3D sensing camera like an Azure Connect or into RealSense, which provides us not just the color information, not just the RGB data, but actually RGBD, which means RGB color plus D depth. Right, so we get the color plus the depth data and the depth data basically means the distance, how far is this away, how far is that away. And what we developed with HoloBeam is basically a streaming solution where we can package up the data, encode it in such a way that we can do a live real-time uh, volumetric video stream. And then on the viewing side, like when you wear the HoloLens, we show this point cloud. We're doing a real-time uh, reconstruction of the point cloud so you can actually see the other person as a hologram in your own space. And that's pretty exciting. And it's not just about um, communication and seeing each other as a hologram, which is already pretty nice, uh, but it's also about immersive workspaces, like collaboration scenarios, right? And so this video is actually from a keynote from Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO, what I have shown our solution, which was pretty exciting. And here you can see the people at this kind of typical meeting room set up. And then there's a virtual hologram, a person that is not physically present there, of course, and you can see him there, of course, he's, in, like I mentioned, in a whole different setup, and we can view him as he would be part of that meeting at the meeting table. And so the lady can see him with the HoloLens right in the place. The other people can see the, the um, uh, observer view and the mirror on the screen.
So what I mentioned, it's immersive workspaces, right? Collaboration scenarios. And this is what you see here. So this is a 3D model. And again, that's actually not just a stupid 3D model, a static model. It's actually a dynamic digital twin. And this is a building. You see the green sticks. These are basically temperature sensors. And now imagine this gentleman is actually a remote expert like a Thomas Dart company or an architect or whatever, and they need to solve an issue because some rooms are too hot and some are too cold, right? And so instead of having to travel there, uh, we can actually enable him by, uh, you know, holobeam, by, you can see each other as a hologram, plus we synchronize the coordinate spaces, which means if you point at something, if you point at this 3D model, you can actually see where the other person is pointing, right? Because it's synchronized. And that is, of course, much more immersive than just looking at an avatar or a 2D video, uh, you know, viewing that in 3D and having this collaboration uh, with these kind of 3D models is just pretty exciting. What's next? So, well, a couple of things. And so let me actually show you a live demo for a moment with the Hollowbeam virtual camera. So let me, let me move the screen sharing thingy over here. So you can see that. So this is Zoom's thingy, right? So this is Zoom's kind of uh, control when you do screen sharing. That's how it looks like. And so what I will do now is, and I have a little bit of sunlight in here. Let me close the shades a little bit. Sorry for that. Right, let me try to get the, get this get this fixed. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. All right, so what I'm going to do is, I will switch webcam. So here you can see my cameras. Again, this is Zoom, right? That's all what you can see here is in Zoom. And look at this, what we have here in Zoom. We have a hollow beam camera. And what that is, is I will switch to that. There we go. And now you should see me, oopsie. Uh, let, me, let me disable the virtual background for a moment. There we go. All right, that's how it looks like. And feel free to actually make the video of myself now large. So you just double click on the little video icon and there uh, you can see the, the video stream a little bit better and the screen sharing. Uh, we will switch that back later on. Anyway, so what you can see here is basically a Holobeam running on my PC at the moment. And we built this Holobeam virtual camera. Basically think about it, it's kind of a bridge into any meeting solution. So it could be Teams, it could be Zoom, it could be Skype, right? And so we can just select Holobeam camera there. And I, as you can see, it's really in fact 3D, right? So I'm, I'm showing a point cloud here and uh, we can do similar things uh, like I've shown you before. The little uh, black dots you can see are just reflections from the infrared on my glasses right here. But anyway, um, this is Holobeam. Uh, integrated into any meeting solution. Of course, what you want to use is something like a HoloLens in the end or another 3D viewing device if you want to have a really great participation in, in Holobeam. But anyway, you know, with this kind of Holobeam bridge, as I call it, we have this integration into any meeting solution and can do a lot of things. So I have the model viewer here. I can also move these free models around and, you know, do some other fancy things. Here's our amazing UI. And yeah, so here's the full model viewer. I could load a few more models and then we could you know, integrate. Someone might have a real uh, 3D camera. And again, I'm just using one uh, Kinect here. If I would use a few more, of course, we would fill these holes and you would see a, a even crisper picture, right? But yeah, this is 3D Holobeam integrated as a plugin into, well, any video meeting solution. All right, um, let me actually switch the camera back to the other one and enable virtual backgrounds. There we are. Alrighty, and uh, please switch to the green screen sharing again, double click on the screen sharing so you can see it a little bit larger there. And I will continue now uh, with my presentation. Alrighty, so we had the demo. Um, here's another one. So this is Holbeam running on a looking glass and the looking glass is a volumetric light field display. And uh, what that means is basically a volumetric light field display um, allows you to see, oops, the video stopped, um, allows you to see 3D content without having to wear any stereo glass. <laughs> so you don't need to wear any stereo glass. There's no special head mounted device. Um, you can see 3D content with this display. As you can see, it's just a small one, nine inch. There's a bigger one available. Here's the Azure Connect, right? The 3D camera. And this is basically my setup. You could see here at the moment also how I did the, the live feed a little bit before. Uh, you see the looking glass is a little bit limited resolution, limited viewing angle, um, but it's impressive how far they come already. And look at this. This is what they have shown at an expo a few months ago when we were still able to do expos and events. Um, Oh, look at this, this is 8K and 
a 3D version of it. It's a little bit expensive at the moment and it's not available in masses, but you know, this technology is gaining a lot of momentum and there are other companies working on similar solutions when are actually aiming at huge scale, like cinema scale, cinema size kind of scale, right? That's what some of them are aiming for or a mall that you have a mall where you have a huge wall of these kind of volumetric displays, right? Uh, if a bit more research here is uh, also exciting. This is from University of Sussex what they show, um, well, holograms, basically a holographic projector. And what they are doing is a little bit different. So you might have seen these kind of holographic projections where they basically use fog and then they shoot laser rays into the fog and then you can see uh, this kind of hologram in that or there are also different approaches, of course. But what they're doing is really uh, innovative, I think, because they're basically using uh, sound. So they're using, as you can see on the video, this speaker array. So you have these tiny speakers, a ton of them, right? And an array at the top and the bottom. And there's a little beat, a little ball, a styrofoam ball that is actually a polystyrene beat or sphere that is moving through that acoustic trap. So you have these acoustic trap and then if it's moving fast enough, you shoot LED light on it, you can see 3D objects, right? And so that's how they're doing it. And it's, it's a pretty incredible, innovative solution, I think. Uh, again, just research, but this is exciting. Let me actually show you. There's a, a piece in the video. Yeah, here, see the gentleman grabbing into the acoustic trap and grabbing this little ball, this little pyro, uh, polystyrene bead out of that. Look at this. It's really just a small ball moving fast enough into the acoustic trap, shooting with LED light. Exciting. I can't wait to see this actually in real products. Um, super, uh, well, innovative, I think. All right, so we talked about different ways of viewing content you know again with hollow beam for example we have basically the streaming solution we can support different uh, inputs different 3d cameras we can also support different viewing uh, devices like i've shown you uh, multiple of those um this here is a little bit different this is basically from the from the capturing side right so we use a 3d sensing camera like i mentioned uh, but in this one we actually also uh, trained a deep neural network for um, depth estimation or depth, yeah, depth estimation basically in the end. And so what you do is you take training data for this deep neural network for this AI model, uh, which consists of these kind of RGBD frames. So uh, you run it through, and then it basically learns kind of how to estimate depth just based on the color information. So basically what you can see here is a, a YouTube video, which is just RGB color information. We run that through the trained neural network and then it evaluates and spits out the depth output estimated which you can see on the bottom right. And then we can use that to project that a little bit into the, uh, the 3D setting, right? Of course, that's not as, as sophisticated as you, you know, if you would use uh, a full 3D camera like a Kinect, uh, but still, you know, it's easily approachable and uh, you just need a normal webcam. So uh, working a little bit on that, of course, it's still quite early and takes a little bit more time, but you know, exciting stuff happening in that space for sure. All right, while we are talking about AI and uh, you know, spatial computing with AI, let me show you another demo uh, which I created using object recognition running on the HoloLens directly, right? So uh, what I did here is basically I took a deep neural network, which I trained using uh, cognitive services, uh, custom vision AI. Uh, it's an Azure, well, it's a Microsoft cloud service basically, where you take a bunch of photos of your objects, upload them, you have a nice website interface, basically. You take these photos, give them a label, take another set of photos, give them another label, and then you know hit a button actually in the browser, it trains the neural network, and then you get a REST API, which you can just send the images to and then recognize it. But what I did here is something else. Um, I exported that model as an ONNX model, as an Onyx model, and then I actually used WinML, Windows Machine Learning, which is part this of Windows AI, meter to run it directly in the whole lens. So here you can see the object detection results, right? And the distance. This might, this might be a matchstick 1.1 meter in front of you. I'm using just the spatial mapping capabilities of the whole lens this for the distance. This is likely a minibus 3.1 right? meter in front of you. But object recognition is done with this custom deep neural network that runs this is directly on the whole lens. Right? It's not sending, meter in front of it's not you. sending any frames to the cloud. It does all the processing on the device which is pretty exciting. And so you might know, might say, well, this is what is this good for? This can hear this text to speech, right? So this you. can be for low vision or blind people. But also in general, I mean, we all know what a hammer and a power drill is, this might but be a hammer it could be specialized tools. And it could be, for you. example, you buy something at Ikea, 
and you want to have instructions. You just look at it this with a device like a HoloLens, it recognizes what kind of product it is, and then shows you. you what kind of things you want to do. And of course, you can have your favorite beer brand in there, right? <laughs> so. This might be a Raid Burger yeah. beer bottle 1.2 meter in front of you. Well, it's it's 5.30, all, almost time for beer, but well, not yet, right? This anyway, so <laughs> in the video, I had it running on the HoloLens CPU. Uh, I now have it running on the HoloLens GPU. Um, with the HoloLens 1. In this case, you can see it's much, much faster if you run it on a GPU because the amazing part with uh, Windows AI and WinML is it actually uses hardware acceleration for you know speeding up these kind of deep neural network inference evaluation phases. And yeah, exciting stuff. I have it now also running on the HoloLens 2. Um, there's a little little thing going on with the GPU driver here. So I'm waiting for an update on that. But once that runs, uh, we're getting close to real time, like 30 uh, or 40 milliseconds for one evaluation phase, right? So that's exciting. And then we can also think about more complex uh, deep neural networks and not just a squeeze net, which is what I used here, a compact model. But anyway, right? Mixed reality plus AI, exciting use cases, I think. And let me show you the, the uh, one real quick video about the HoloLens 2 and the spatial mapping capabilities. And so, you know, you can see these augmented reality objects. So this is my garden and um, you can see me shooting meatballs at, you know, these boxes and myself basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> no, really. Um, I actually made this for a talk in Sweden, I think. So I had these kind of, uh, you know, meatballs that you can shoot. Um, but anyway, what I wanted to show you is like how good the spatial mapping of the HoloLens is. Because as you can see, it's really precise, right? If we have this spatial map, the HoloLens can recognize the real world with the depth camera, it can reconstruct it. And now let's take a look at this. When I shoot these meatballs, these virtual meatballs at the real world slide, there's a little sink at the end of the slide where these meatballs get stuck. And we're talking about a sink that is maybe like this. It's not, it's not very deep, right? It's just like a few centimeters, if at all, maybe it's just even a centimeter or less. And that's it's really impressive how precise the spatial mapping is and how good the whole lens uh, does a job here. I think I actually also showed the spatial mesh a little bit. So here you can see the reconstruction might be a little bit jittering with the video, but here you can see a mesh overlaid and this is how it reconstructs the real world. Uh, really big improvement there from the whole lens too, which is by the way, using the same depth sensor as the Azure Connect. The whole lens too uses the same depth sensor as the Azure Connect, right? Uh, this is also open source, right? So go to my GitHub page if you wanna play around with that. All right. Little break, not really. Uh, let's talk about large scale digital twins. So I've shown you these digital twin models, right? And the challenge is of course always, how do I get that 3D model? And if I get a 3D model, it might be too complex to render on a mobile device like HoloLens. And so there's this exciting new Azure Mixed Reality service, which is called Azure Remote Rendering. And what it allows you is actually to render these complex 3D models, not on the device itself, but actually in the cloud. Remote rendering is the name of that, right? And so we do this kind of remote rendering in, on these powerful Azure GPU virtual machines. And how does it work? Well, you know, the input from the whole lens, like the, uh, the head, the six stuff input, right? The head rotation and position, the six stuff, uh, plus hand input, because, you know, it, as you know, it also recognizes hand input. And all of that input data is being sent from the whole lens into the cloud, where you have these remote rendering engine running. It renders these frames, frames there for the left and the right eye and streams them back as a video. And then it does a very smart composition where it you know, projects these kind of depth video, uh, sorry, these videos for the left and right eye with the correct depth into your local rendering. And that is impressive. And what you can see here is actually a model that has 18.7 million polygons and it's being rendered with physical based rendering, right? With really nice shading and so on. And as you can see, when I move around, there's almost no latency. I was so surprised that it works so well when I tried it out the first time. It's impressive what they did with Azure Remote Rendering ARR. Really, really good and well done. And it doesn't even take a ton of bandwidth. Um, they say 50 Mbit is recommended for the download. Uh, in my test, it used like 20 Mbit or so. Here you can see it's actually just 16 Mbit. Uh, that is being used for downstream streaming that uh, volumetric, uh, sorry, for this you know video kind of rendering. So again, we can take existing CAD models. We can take CAD models, computer-aided design models that a lot of engineering departments are using to design their products. And the challenge we always were facing is like, 
oh, we got these cat models from clients and they're so big and you can render them on the whole lens. So what you have to do is you need to do a reduction. You need to do a match reduction. And that is very labor intensive and time consuming as well. Of course, there are some tools that automate that a little bit, but the quality is always not that great, right? And again, in the end, if you throw out stuff so that you can fit it into the rendering budget of a whole lens, well, you end up with information loss, right? But with this kind of technology with remote rendering, we can actually render it directly on the device as it is. And I think about 5G again, right? Of course, that would also work with 4G mostly, but uh, you know, 50 Mbit is recommended. Then also 5G dedicated uh, slicing and you know, all of these pieces are coming together. Uh, what you can see here is actually another uh, remote rendered model this is a photogrammetry model of the uh, Pincho sculptures in beautiful Rome. We cannot go there at the moment, at least I cannot. I'm in Germany, right? We are not allowed to travel. And so we can at least travel there virtually, if you will. And uh, there's a, but there's a real business case. Um, again, photogrammetry, if you're not familiar with that, basically what it does is you take a ton of photos, like hundreds of thousands of photos from all the different angles from these objects, run it through a software like Reality Capture, which gives you a point cloud and in the end, a 3D model of that real world object. And then you can uh, take that and have a, a real world capture basically done without too much effort. And so the challenge of course, is when we're dealing with these kind of digital twins and we need to get a digital twin is either we have a cat model, but sometimes you also don't have any cat model and you need to sit down and create a new 3D model. But we can do, use these photogrammetry uh, solutions to basically get a, a high detailed 3D model. And now with ARR, we can render that uh, in real time using remote rendering. And here I took a model from Smithsonian Public Access. This is from the Smithsonian, which has the Discovery Space Shuttle on display. And they also did a photogrammetry scan of that. You can download a few different versions. I think this is uh, the version with a few million polygons. Uh, the video is a little bit shaky and so on, but anyway, uh, what you can see here is a space shuttle nearby my house. I mean, how cool is that uh, at the full scale? And again, these kind of solutions like with remote rendering, I think are super important because it will also allow us to shrink down the form factors, right? Because what we want in the end is a form factor like my glasses here, for example. And you know, if I offload some of the complex processing to a cloud service and I have a low latency solution where I can stream it real time, well, that's, that's exciting, I think. And again, with 5G together, right, we have the, the right network technology as well. And yeah, that allows us to do a lot of things. Um, the HoloLens does some clever tricks here to adjust for the delay. They do so-called late state reprojection and pose estimation. So basically they estimate the pose where the user might be going, render that. And then in the meantime, of course, the user might have moved a little bit differently and since then, therefore they use so-called late state reprojection, but they're reprojecting the rendered images so it fits so well. And again, they did an amazing job. Um, I, have, I did not expect such a good quality, but it's really amazing. Alrighty, uh, let's talk about another Azure Mixed Reality service called Azure Spatial Anchors. And that is part of this whole AR cloud technology I mentioned initially a little bit, the augmented reality cloud, right? And um, Gartner, the market research company, also labels that as one of the highest ratings they have is transformational, and they label the AR cloud as transformational. And we will spend the rest of the, the, the webinar here actually talking about those. I will show you a ton of use cases. But let me explain, first of all, a little bit more visually uh, what it is and you know, why you should care about it. So this is a video uh, from 60AI, uh, a small startup that are also working on an AI cloud solution. So what you can see here is these gentlemen are walking around in this office and each of them has their own cell phone, just using iPhones here. And they're doing all a little scan of a certain area, right? They're all creating a little puzzle piece of the whole thing, of the whole office in the end, right? And then, you know, the power of the AI cloud is taking, you know, these siloed from each device, all these experiences from each one, and then uploading them into the whole kind of uh, AR cloud uh, storage or solution and processing power you have there, right? So all these small puzzle pieces are stitched together to create you this, this full puzzle, if you will. And then you have this digital twin of your real world, which you can of course use as a 3D capture, which is already pretty great. But even nicer is you have the reference. You have a virtual reference of the real world and then you can you know, place virtual content on top of that. And so why, why is that called a spatial anchor and the AI cloud spatial anchor, what is that stuff? Well, let's step back for a moment and talk what is a spatial anchor. And you might know what an anchor is, you know, from a ship. And similar like to a ship, 
when you throw out the anchor, the ship won't move. If you throw out a spatial anchor, your virtual content won't move, right? But instead of having an anchor, we're actually talking about a coordinate system. So a spatial anchor is basically a custom coordinate system, a frame of reference in the end. And again, like if you move around, spatial anchor will stay the same, right? Even if you move your device, your content won't move, right? And so we can attach virtual content to that spatial anchor, which will stay in place as it relates to the real world uh, location. And it will maintain its pose, position and orientation, even if you walk around, right? Since it's not related to the camera and the device coordinate system, but it has its own spatial coordinate system. And that of course is very important because this allows us to uh, do a lot of amazing things where we can persist augmented reality content uh, in the real world. But this just lives on your own device. And all of these devices we, we all know and love, uh, like all the lens or one and two, um, AR Core on Android or AR Kit on iOS or Magic Leap with their PCF, they all have uh, a concept, they all have an implementation of spatial anchors. It might just call it a little bit differently. Some call them AR anchor, some call it world anchor. Magic Leap calls it a persisted coordinate frame, PCF, but it's the same thing. Um, it's this kind of real world um, location, right, that you maintain an anchor. And again, that just lives on your device, right? It lives on this HoloLens or it lives on this mobile phone. And the power of the cloud is, uh, and the cloud spatial anchor is that we can have that stored in the cloud and can share it cross platform, right? So if I take the anchor I created, upload it to ASA, Azure Spatial Anchor Service, my friend comes, downloads that same anchor on his device and it maps it into the tracking system of that device. He can see or she can see the same content at the exact same location as it relates to the real world, right? So we can enable these multi-user shared scenarios, which is amazing because you fit so many devices. You know, we are AR Kit, AR Core, it's over a billion devices already that support that kind of capability, right? And so ASA supports um, Android, AR Core, iOS, AR Kit, and HoloLens 1 and 2, right? And so cross-platform and sharing is supported. And even more important, I think, is persistence. And that is amazing because I can create an anchor and come back a week later and then can download that from the ASA service and you know, view it at the exact same location. Right? Um, here are some experiments where I tested this out. So this is running on Android phones, recorded on Android phone, my good old Samsung S8. I created an anchor there, uploaded to the ASA service. And what you can see now is the first person view of the HoloLens. I'm still holding my Android phone in front. So I downloaded that anchor created with the Android on the HoloLens, and then it maps it into the tracking system. As you can see, it's really precise, right? The same anchor on the Android is basically the same location as on HoloLens. And that's impressive, uh, like really a centimeter range precision here. And so as you can imagine, this is using computer vision. We'll talk a little bit more about it, how it works. But basically, um, this is not using GPS. Because if we were to use GPS, we would use get meter range precision. With this, we get five to 10 centimeter range precision, something around that. And of course, in a real world situation, you would combine all of that. You would use a course relocalization using GPS. You would say, okay, I'm in this spot. I want to get like all the anchors that are around me, like 50 meters or so. And then you would uh, reduce the search space a little bit for the actually computer vision that Azure Spatial Anchors is using. So cross platform, right, shared scenarios. Here's another one with persistence. So went to the Seattle Pike Place market, created an anchor over there. Um, you will see it in a moment, attached the virtual sign there with the company logo, right? And then a few days later, I came back and of the second or so, it relocalized the same anchor at the exact same location. And you notice there are a lot of people walking around, the floor changed because it was raining and then it dried up when I relocalized a few days later, but it's still able to actually manage that. And that is, Super impressive, actually, what they pulled off with ASA, because uh, you have so much changing, you know, items all the time. Again, it's using computer vision, right? No GPS, so you have all these changing stuff, you know, vision. So, yeah, impressive, really impressive, how good it works. Um, here's another one where you can actually see what kind of data it captures, because you might wonder, well, if you're doing all this computer vision stuff, it basically analyzes camera frames. What happens with all that camera data? I don't want to send it to the cloud, right? Because we need to think about privacy and security. And I can only speak for the ASA team because I know them very well and I know they pay so much attention to privacy and security. 
Uh, I cannot speak for other big companies that might be doing something else, but with ASA, no camera frame is leasing, leaving your device. It, it does the camera processing on the device itself. Uh, what you can see here on the little video, uh, these rectangles with the red dots, these are the camera frames. So this is how the thing moves through the scene, uh, the device moves through the scene. And what it's extracting from these camera frames on the device, right, is these green dots. These are so-called feature points. And a set of these feature points basically makes up an anchor. And this is, you can also call it a sparse point cloud, but basically this is the, um, identification for the real world spot you can see on the left side that's the scene basically in the real world and this is the extracted feature points right you cannot make up the real world out of that and so only these set of feature points being uploaded to the asa cloud servers and actually what they do there is they do a spatial hash so they generate a hash value which is spatially aware so you compute the distance basically later on when you relocalize and uh, you know can see okay what is the probability that it's the same spot and that works amazing well. So again, even in the in the cloud servers, they're actually just storing a spatial hash, not even these feature point sets. So there's no way to reverse engineer from that, at least not now, right? Might change with quantum computing, but that's a different topic for another webinar maybe. Um, but anyway, just wanna make sure security, privacy is paying a lot of attention. No camera frame is leaving your device. All right, let's talk about some scenarios. And uh, I wanna show you a little demo of an app we're building. Uh, but basically, this is about collaborative design reviews. So think about these kids and the lady, they all have different devices, right? iPhone, Android, HoloLens, the lady has a HoloLens too, and they can view the same content together, right? Which allows us to visualize complex data, complex data to collaborate with 3D projects with cross-functional teams, right? And there's quite a business value here that we can optimize the flexibility, safety, quality, and so much more, right? Okay, here's a demo. Um, so this is an app we're building, the Azure Spatial Anchors app, very creative name. <laughs> but what you can see here is recorded on an Android device, right? So the gentleman is scanning the space to get enough feature points, you know, that he can create an anchor. And once he has enough feature points data gathered, he can create an anchor. So this is the anchor he created. Now take a look at the lady. She's scanning around with her iPhone and she's relocalizing the anchor the gentleman created on his Android phone. And so they now share the same anchor. What we also integrated is OneDrive into this application so you can actually load a model from your OneDrive, uh, whatever 3D model it could be, right? You can just drop any 3D model in your OneDrive and uh, we, we load that and you can place it in AR. And cross-platform shared, right? Now think about professional scenarios as well. Oh, by the way, we also have real-time interactions, of course, right, that you can move them. Uh, for this, we're using uh, Signal R on Azure uh, for have the real-time interactions because ASA just provides you the initial location, right? But then after you have the initial reference, you need to, um, you know, figure out yourself how you do the, the, the transformations in real-time. So we're using Signal on Azure. You could also use Photon or whatever networking technology. So that also is very relevant for um, you know, enterprise use cases. Um, think about your have a meeting and you, they need to install a new machine at a chemical facility, for example, which are typically very dense already. They have a lot of content, a lot of machines and modules there already. But with AR, they can see it one-to-one -one scale in the real spot. They can have a cross-platform shot meeting. Everyone can use the device they have. Uh, plus, we can persist it. So we can you know, even uh, save the kind of anchor there and tell other folks that we're not able to attend the meeting because we can only have small meetings these days uh, that they come back later at, at a later time, right? And, and view the same content at the exact same spot. Or here's another scenario. Uh, think about digital twin dashboards on top of real machines. Um, so we have a, you know, these IoT sensors are typically headless. They don't have a display. And so we can place a virtual display there and we can get real-time insights into the data much faster than having to search through you know complex information and pages on a control room panel whatever right you look at the machine you see a virtual panel there um, of course very interesting wayfinding uh, wayfinding is also possible because if you create these anchors in one session you can connect them with each other right so if I create first anchor and I create a second anchor it knows what the first anchor is so you get them connected and so I can enable wayfinding scenarios. Imagine a situation where you have a failure in a facility. Like here, a machine is failing, for example, right? And so there's a person, an engineer in a control room 
that is monitoring all these machines and I see a blinking LED and what they need to do now is well they need to open a book and find where's the machine and maybe blueprints and a lot of paperwork these days right and that can be optimized of course think about we're using object recognition so they take put on a hall lens or take the phone it recognizes what kind of machine is failing on the dashboard loads the data dynamically the wayfinding information and then guides this gentleman or the lady to the actual machine that is failing right so you see like little green arrows on the floor and it guides you to the machine and therefore on this machine then you find it much faster and think about the other one i showed you earlier with the holographic kind of repair instructions so we can show these kind of repair instructions maintenance instructions on top of the real machine in the context which is uh, of course quite uh, valuable and that might just save a few minutes or even just seconds uh, you know to resolve the issue but you know if these big facilities shut down just for a few seconds it can cost hundreds of thousands of euros or dollars right so quite some business value um, or think about some consumer use case so what I did here is I created a spatially aware grocery list. Uh, so take a look at this. Um, I got the note from my wife on the left hand side and I transformed that into a spatially aware grocery list, right? So the stuff I had to buy uh, at the exact location in the, in the store. And as you notice, this was, uh, I did this video, of course, a little bit earlier, a while ago, because there was still a lot of toilet paper available. These were the good old times when there was still white gold in the stores, right? <laughs> Well, anyway, you you imagine, like I said, you know, this is all secure and privacy and actually the ASA service lives on your own Azure tenant. Now imagine you have a retail store company that provides such an app for their clients and they make a deal basically, okay, we might analyze a little bit what you're doing. And so then they can say, oh, buy two and get free, right? We noticed you buy the product very often and place a virtual banner right at the exact object you're buying or want to buy. And so there's uh, some potential as well, getting these kind of hyper-personalized data in for brick and mortar stores that have been struggling with the online retail competition because they always have this hyper-personalized data. And so there's quite some value here. Um, also sampling virtual products that are not available in the store, right? There's a ton of use cases for these kind of scenarios, I think. Alrighty, uh, we just talked about visual content on top of these anchors, right? Uh, but it doesn't have to be because an anchor again is a location in the real world and what you can see here is what are actually using spatial sound snippets on top of these anchors so as you can see the lady is blind and yes. she's using an app from microsoft called seeing ai yes and your phone to map the room so she's mapping the room getting the first anchor information so finding the first anchor basically and then they're pulling in the wayfinding information with this seeing ai app using asa room 1200 where can I sit? Pan your phone to map the room. Table at 12 o'clock, empty seat located at 11 o'clock. Hey, glad you're here. Let's get started. All righty. We will be a little bit over time here. Uh, I have a few more slides, but anyway, I think... It should be worth it, I hope at least. Uh, anyway, uh, the previous scenario, I mean, with the um, with this one, with the, the blind lady, basically, this is amazing, I love it, because we're using super high tech with AI object recognition to build a solution that really provides value for humans, right? And that's why I love working with this technology, where we can build these kind of inclusive and diverse environments where we can empower everyone. That's awesome, I love it. Um, here's another scenario, real quick, uh, you know, basically guiding you through a theme park, uh, this is a concept I got from our uh, friends at Studio Zero Five. Uh, basically, they're having a little Lego figure that guides you through the store, uh, through the theme park. Uh, just a concept, but we're in conversations to make this a reality because we now have the technology with ASA, right? So where we can uh, stream and and you know load dynamic data and uh, you know let us guide through by this little Lego man uh, through the uh, theme park. Or this one, uh, think about urban murals and digital art, right? We can draw everywhere. We can put AR content all over the place and have it even persisted with this kind of technology. And so I saw this graffiti a while ago in LA and I, I loved it because, you know, you see these two businessmen having a Rubik's cube and trying to solve each other to lend a deal or whatever. But there's this public parking sign, which ruins this whole piece. And why not bring in some AR content like our good old friend Clippy? And I hope I'm not showing my age here, and some of you still know uh, Clippy, 
but even better, we can have Clippy now in 3D because we're talking about AR, right? Uh, but think about other use cases, Snapchat, Instagram, all these social media, or TikTok, all these social media apps with the AR filters. At the moment, you can just record a video or photo, but in the future, we can actually, actually right now we can implement it. Uh, we can have this content persisted. So you can tell your friends, go to this place and scan your phone and see what I dropped there, right? Um, here's another one, creating a digital copies, but I will skip forward to this one because this is also a similar scenario uh, about 3D capture visualization. So what I, what I used here in this application, I created a spatial anchor, persisted this anchor, and what you can see now, I'm relocalizing this, right? So this is in front of my house, I relocalized the anchor, and there you see the virtual uh, Easter Bunny sculpture. And this is a 3D scan I did with my mobile phone. Yeah, just with my mobile phone. On the right-hand side, you can see the real-world bunny. That's the real one. My, my uncle makes those. And um, you can see the digital twin of the Easter bunny on the left-hand side, which I created just with my Samsung S20 Plus, which has an, a time-of-flight sensor. So it has a little 3D camera in here. And I just walked around the real-world sculpture, maybe 40 seconds or so. And then I got a 3D model of that, which I exported, loaded into our ASA, Azure Spatial Anchor application, where I could then place the anchor attached with the 3D model of the Easter Bunny, the digital twin of it, and you know relocalize it. And now I can you know place it, scale it up, and I could tell my uncle if he has some time if he can make me a new one which is larger because I can see it in 3D. Uh, but think about this Easter Bunny, which I you know re removed it now, of course, since Easter is is over. But anyway, uh, think about this could be whatever object could be an engine, could be a machine, could be a reactor, could be any anything you see in a facility. And so we can easily create these digital twins this, or the basis for these digital twins, the 3D models with mobile devices these days. The whole workflow I'm showing you here is on mobile, right? I created the 3D model on mobile. I put this uh, 3D model on mobile in AR and persisted the content. If that's not exciting, I don't know. A um, lot of business value. The uh, other thing, of course, games. ASA is great for games, location-based games, right? Scavenger hunt, hide and seek games. And so uh, a lot of, of that is being used here. I built a little uh, scavenger hunt game with fruits all over the place. I persisted um, there and then I can, you know, have the user like try to find these other fruits and so on. Uh, but anyway, you know, what, what is awesome about ASA, it basically democratizes location-based AR game development. And for example, Microsoft is using that themselves here with uh, Minecraft Earth, in fact, so the, the AR version of Minecraft. And it is using Azure Spatial Anchors under the hood for placing, you know, these kind of virtual adventures in the real world. And then you can have cross-platform shared scenarios, right? Where you can play it together. Of course, that is only possible with a technology like ASA that's using computer vision that gives us the real precision, right? Uh, with Pokemon Go, these other that are just GPS based, you would never get this kind of precision that you get here while you're using computer vision. So you can have these kind of shared scenarios and then also persisted, right? You can have these adventures persisted in the park or something. Or here in this video, I love this because you can see this little bow and arrow when they play the game attached to the phone and you know you can play it together in the real world uh, with really precise location and it's democratizing it so everyone can build it and so now go and build some cool spatial computing stuff or ask us how we can help you to build something like that uh, like i mentioned we're doing a lot of that work and are always happy to uh, help to implement these kind of things so feel free to reach out I think it's an exciting time. Um, we see science fiction technology becoming a reality, right? We have these spatial computing devices uh, with like a whole lens, of course, these kind of devices are the most exciting ones, the head devices, but it could even be a mobile phone, right? So we have these spatial computing devices and the AR cloud. So we have the digital twin of the real world. We can put context in the real world, which we can visualize and capture with these spatial computing devices. And yeah, I mean, that's stuff we have seen just a few years ago in sci-fi, and now it's becoming a reality, which is pretty amazing. And uh, I think that 2020s um, will not just be about the, um, the COVID-19 situation and all the, the things we have to deal with, but I think especially spatial computing will help us also to um, restart and reinvent in the post-pandemic phase, uh, where we can do a lot of amazing things with spatial computing uh, for, you know, also dealing with these kind of situations. 
And so again, uh, thanks for your attention. Uh, if you want to stick around, I know we're a few minutes over, but I will stick around for a few more minutes. I will take a look at the chat window. And so uh, let me know if you have any other questions. I know there are already six questions already. So let's dive into that. Oh, and by the way, feel free to connect. You see my Twitter handle there, my name, uh, find me on LinkedIn, email as well. Uh, you know, just reach out and uh, we can connect. But let me take a look at the, um, at the chat window real quick. Um, I go from top to bottom. All right, so Roy is asking, or actually let me, you should see, still see my screen. Let me move that guy over here. You might see me from the side, but I guess that's okay. Um, Roy is asking, hi Roy, by the way, um, will adoption of LiDAR by mobile device manufacturer make special wear apps a big Oh yes. Um, you know, the new iPad Pro also has a time of flight sensor or LiDAR sensor and, you know, Samsung S20 Plus and, you know, all the other devices, I think Huawei and a few more, they all have depth sensors and we will see more of that coming. And that is super exciting. I think that is really, really helping. Uh, Brock is asking, I'm still unclear about the definition of spatial computing. Are you saying it's an, any interaction that uses spatial positioning? So AR contains spatial computing or spatial computing contains AR? Uh, yeah, sorry if I confused you. Uh, spatial computing is basically an umbrella term and it contains AR, VR and more. Um, it computes uh, also contains devices like an Azure Connect here, like a, s a camera sensor or, or uh, other devices that can spatially sense their surroundings, right? So spatial computing, uh, uh, think about it, it's an umbrella term for AR and VR, and it, you, know, you can say it much nicer than AR, VR, MR, blah, blah, blah. Just say spatial computing, you've got them all covered, and it ties nicely into the story, like personal computing, mobile computing, spatial computing. Um, anonymous attendee is asking, is one connect enough for capturing holo porting or does it need more? Um, Yes, you can use one with hollow beam, but we can also support multiple. We actually, you know, you, you can use like three or six and then you get a more like full capture of yourself. So that is helping quite a bit. Um, but you know, for most situations, like I've shown you, one is actually pretty enough because you get the first half of that. And when you were especially dealing with this kind of meeting situation, there's very few times where you actually walk around people in a real world meeting, right? But if you're wearing a device like this where you can see stereo 3D, you can still see like the structure of that person in 3D, right? The front side of it. But again, we can use multiple ones as well. Um, Roy is asking, is it possible to replay the holograms in 3D using Holobeam? Yes, uh, we can also record these kind of holographic things. Uh, these hollow beams, and then we can use them also to play it back. I have not shown that video, but uh, we have one where we're actually using it. And that's uh, super exciting because it's much more immersive uh, telling, you know, have a hologram explaining you things than just listening to audio. Uh, Jose is asking, uh, by when do you think Microsoft might enter the consumer market with HoloLens and depend on what amount of content available, low enough price point? Um, I don't work for Microsoft. And I don't want to speculate too much, but at the moment, you know, HoloLens to three and a half thousand dollars form factor, a few more years, I would say. I'm hopeful that in the 2020s, we will see, and we're already seeing other competitors like, um, what's the name of the company? Um, ah, I forgot. Anyway, so there's like some companies that are working on very small form factors and, uh, you know, there's Unreal. Enreal, that's the company I was thinking about. Enreal like makes a very small form factor and they actually have a collaboration now with Microsoft, I think about mixed reality. They had some announcement there, but I think like in the 2020s, we will see small form factors for sure. Uh, sorry, gotta go mate, I was wonderful. Yep, okay, thank you. <laughs> glad, glad you enjoyed it. Uh, what do you think about collaborative environments for office with immersive technologies? Which kind of business can benefit this most? Uh, you know, I am everyone. Like when I look at the clients we work with, it's all verticals. Um, there's no single uh, vertical, I would say, that is benefiting the most. There's so many exciting scenarios. Uh, at the moment, of course, like due to price, form factor, devices like the whole lens or more for enterprise scenarios, professional use cases. Uh, but again, we also have these kind of, you know, bridge technology, if you will. Well, not bridge technology, but mobile computing devices that support spatial computing, right? Um, a few more questions down here. Uh, I will try to go through all of them. And you sh see also the feedback form now. Um, while I answer the questions, please fill out the feedback, um, quality of the presentation, how effective and so on. Uh, please vote there so that we can improve these kind of uh, webinars. 
Um, anyway, so let me just go through the other questions. Uh, you reminded me your open source project, but also PhoneScan, HoloLens Connect, and Resense. How do you connect all of those? Which SDKs? How you recommend this? Well, um, that's a very long question. Please, we should take it offline, <laughs> as they say sometimes. Uh, but yeah, we, we can chat a little bit more about it. It's a long question. If you want to get with, um, if you want to get started with mobile AR, I would recommend um, to um, to take a look at the Unity courses. They are now free. So Unity has these premium courses now made for free due to COVID. So that's a good start. They have some good courses about AR and VR uh, getting started with Unity as well. And basically, everyone is using Unity as a free tool. Uh, and so. That's, of course, Unreal is also there, but I know many people are using Unity. Uh, what specific expertise skills do you think would be the most useful in the foreseeable spatial computing devices? Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, student, um, HCI, AI, I mean, you're on the right track there for sure. Human computer interfaces and AI, these are the most important ones. I would also recommend take some 3D computer graphics courses, uh, also linear algebra and so on, so that you know the basics, how to do things in 3D and, you know, compute those. But yeah, I think you're on the right track. AI is, of course, very important. Uh, thanks, uh, Ward, for the webinar. Hi, Ward, by the way. Uh, Ward Peters, I guess. Uh, which Azure service did you guys use for networking with ASA? I missed that. Um, yeah, we're using Signal R on Azure. Signal R, real-time communication, and it, it supports Azure as well, so we're using that. But you could also go with a custom role one or Unity's Photon and a few more, right? Stefan Rode is asking, what Azure spatial anchors do, uh, would be duplicated in similar environments? For example, one anchor within an ICE train kitchen be recognized in another train ICE kitchen looking exactly the same. Yes, that would be the case. And so, if because it's using computer vision, right? And if these kind of locations look the same, it thinks that it's in the same spot, of course. And that's where you can combine GPS, right? So you can actually combine these sensor data together. You could say, oh, I'm in this location, this GPS location, give me all the anchors that are just surrounding me. And then you would like you know, narrow down the search space already. Um, it's just like as a human, right? If you think about it, if I would, you know, put your, like uh, hold your eyes closed or whatever, and would take you from this ICE train kitchen to the other ICE train kitchen without your, without you seeing that you actually moved, you would not recognize that you actually moved, right? It's the same thing. Computer vision can never be better as human vision. Maybe maybe soon, I don't know, with the AI taking over kind of thing, but we'll see. Anyway, long story short, uh, yes, these are these kind of wormholes kind of things where you think you're on the same thing. How can you solve it? Uh, again, GPS combining these kind of other sensor data, plus uh, you could also um, create multiple anchors, providing you the context, right? Just as you would walk, you could have multiple anchors uh, outside and you know providing you the context. Uh, hey, Corin. I see you are recording a presentation. Will you have a link you can please provide for later viewing? And for you? yes, um, uh, the webinar is recorded, and then we will send it out later on. Uh, Ward, what is according to your biggest use case today for the Hololens? Um, well, uh, giving a shout out to Ward here. Uh, I know you guys are working on a pretty amazing healthcare solution, so that is great. Uh, another, uh, I think, biggest use cases are definitely in the. Um, manufacturing industry, we see a lot of uh, use cases there. But again, in general, it's, uh, it's a lot of uptake in the enterprise and professional use case scenarios. So I wouldn't say there's a, the, the, this kind of hero use case at the moment, but I think we're still at the beginning of the special computing era and uh, we will see it everywhere soon. Uh, when do you think that people will be moving to special computing from a mobile computing? Um, it's, it's not like, it's, there's no break between it. It's it's a smooth transition, if you will, because again, you know, these devices, super powerful these days, have a depth sensor in it already, right? So it's actually, although it is a mobile computing device, it's actually also a spatial computing device. Uh, when do you think people will be moving to spatial? Oh, that's the question. Uh, Unreal, Unreal, yeah. Thanks guys for helping me out. What problem was it with the display of the HoloLens 2? Uh, yeah, well, HoloLens 2, uh, you know, there's certain things that are ongoing with the display with some devices. Mine is actually pretty good. I know some people complain about, um, you know, color abbreviation and that kind of thing. Um, I don't know. I'm not an optics expert, but yeah. Uh, any tests yet of ASA with WebEx or instead of dedicated apps? Uh, I don't know. The uh, ASA works with HoloLens 1.2, uh, Android and iOS. Um, depends on the underlying platform because they're relying on the spatial anchors of the underlying platform. So if your WebXR solution provides you a spatial anchor, I guess it could be added. 
how do you see the future of the immersive web? Uh, well, bright future, I think. There's a lot of progress happening in web VR and especially web AR, which I'm excited about. A company like 8Wall doing an amazing job and you don't need to download an app, you just open a website and you can have an AR experience. I think that's a bright future because, um, you know, especially for mobile devices, like we don't need to download an app, you can just, it's easily really reachable, right? Uh, what could be the impact of this technology post COVID-19 and possible use cases you just says, suggest? Um, we will release a few of those actually in a, in a piece. Um, I just wrote a couple of those down. Um, I don't want to spoil it. So uh, take a look at our uh, reply website. We will keep you updated there, I guess. Um, yeah. I, uh, yeah, a couple of scenarios, a lot actually. Uh, does Valorum offer a productized solution for volumetric collaboration? If so, could we plug in auto stereoscoping monitors to utilize them? Hey, Tom. Um, yeah, I mean, we have the streaming solution in the end, right? So that's a, that's a, a streaming solution and we can support different viewing and streaming devices in the end. Uh, thanks, dude. Uh, <laughs> And the healthcare is bigger. Now it's all about problems. Uh, how does the impact immersive tech? High grade Holobeam is available for free. Uh, no, Holobeam is not available for free. Uh, we're doing uh, piloting. Um, we'll see how we release the bridge I've shown you, like where we can integrate it into meeting solutions uh, with you know, Zoom, Skype, and so on. Uh, we'll see how that goes, uh, but I don't want to say too much at the moment. That was the last question, and we're quite a bit over time, but thanks again for attending. I hope you have a great day. And again, sci-fi is becoming reality with all its facets, right? The good ones and the bad ones with pandemics, but we will get over it. And so thank you, my friends. Take care, stay safe out there. Have a great day.